Hi, my name is Mike McGrath. I'm a professor at UCSF and I've been doing AIDS research for about 30 years. And we're interested and have been interested for these past 30 years on HIV and how it causes cancer. One of the most common cancers is a cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. It's the most common cancer that happens in HIV infected people. Well, what I want to tell you today is a story about a new way of uh, both diagnosing and staging Kaposi sarcoma, as well as how we're developing a novel therapeutic approach to be able to rid Kaposi sarcoma from the AIDS patient population. It employs a real novel targeting mechanism that's been developed by NVIDIA. And the work that I'm going to talk to you today about is some initial diagnostic work that we're doing to be able to show that Kaposi sarcoma can actually be visualized in an actual human being using NVIDIA's targeting approach, and how we can then change it from a targeting visualization program to a targeting chemotherapeutic program that could actually help us treat patients with Kaposi sarcoma. To give you a little bit of background on NVIDIA's targeting technologies, they have an approved diagnostic test called LymphoSeq. And LymphoSeq is actually quite remarkable in that it's a backbone of a dextran, essentially, that has got sugars attached to it that are called mannoses. And mannos in the body will bind to a very specific type of macrophage. We're going to talk about macrophages in a couple of minutes. But allows one to have this backbone with the mannose targeting very specifically one type of macrophage. And this is a type of macrophage that's associated with tumors. So it's relatively rarely in the body in a non-tumor setting, but it's very prevalent if there's a tumor cell within a lymph node, for example. Um, now, NVIDIA has treated, from a diagnostic perspective, over 50,000 patients with this imaging technique. And in this case, they use this backbone with the mannose on it, and they put a radioactive tracer on this particular backbone. When injected into an area where the tumor lives in a patient, it will localize to a lymph node. If that lymph node is the nearest one to the tumor, and especially if that lymph node contains cancer. And that's allowed lymphoseq now to be the best way of defining whether the cancer has spread from the local tumor to an area of lymph node. And of course, that would change the kind of therapy that a patient uh, has to undergo. NVIDIA has approval for use in all solid tumors from a diagnostic perspective. And they did exquisitely careful and sensitive studies on patients with head and neck cancer and you should know that, for example, if you have a head and neck cancer that involves the mouth, prior to lymphoseq, you had to take out all the lymph nodes in the whole neck, which required a radical surgery. They've also looked at breast cancer. We've all known patients with breast cancer who have a tumor-involved breast. And the question is, do they have spread in the lymph node or not? So basically, the way that it is trafficking to these tumor-associated lymph nodes is it's recognizing a type of macrophage, and again, we're gonna talk about that in a second, that expresses the mannose receptor. Remember, lymphoseq has mannose on it that allows it to then bind to this mannose receptor. And like all immunology terminology, it's sort of annoying, but this receptor is called CD206. So from now on, we're gonna talk about CD206 positive cells as being the macrophages that lymphoseq can bind to. So macrophages. Macrophage means big eater. How long can macrophages live? Ever, you all know what a tattoo is, right? So why do I bring up a tattoo? Because a tattoo stays where you put it in the skin. Why is that? It's because a tattoo represents a colored oil droplet that gets eaten by the macrophages in your skin. So how long does a tattoo last? Could last almost forever. So when you think about macrophages, think about them as being very long-lived. They normally, in a normal setting, they protect you from infections, whether it be bacterial or viral infections. They protect you from cancers. They eat dead and dying cells. They're the recycling factory of the body. And in the context of cancer, they switch to this CD206 cell, positive macrophage, that then feeds and nurtures the cancer. So for a cancer to spread, it has to have blood vessels that grow into it. The CD206 positive macrophage makes growth factors for the tumor. It makes factors that the tumors like and allows the tumor to proliferate. 
the two major types of macrophages, one called M1, those cells protect you from cancers. They fight off the cancers. They eat them. They're the inflammatory cells. And the tumor-associated macrophages are called M2. If you have more M2s than M1s, you're going to have your tumor grow. So one of the ideas um, in tumor immunology is to try to figure out how you can switch cells or the balance of the cells back to a tumor-fighting macrophage versus the ones that are nurturing the tumor. So think about this for a second. We've got lymphoseq that can bind to CD206 cells, M2s, and it does not bind to the M1s or the good macrophages. So if you think about the imaging studies done by NVIDIA, setting this whole thing up, just imagine if you had the lymphoseq, but it had a poison on it, and it could only kill the bad macrophages and left the normal ones alone. So that's where this whole story is moving. So let's move from discussion of macrophages to why we're going to be looking at one type of tumor called Kaposi's sarcoma. It's the most common tumor diagnosed in AIDS patients. And about 20% of patients in the United States, and maybe about a third or more in Africa, treated with conventional therapy, have their tumor grow, and it ultimately kills them. It's relatively rare. So if you're developing a drug, that's good news because rare diseases have a faster track for drug development. In this case, um, we're going to be studying Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, and what we noted that hasn't really been noted before is that the CD206 molecule is not only on the tumor-associated macrophages, it's on the tumor cells, which is very different than had been known before. So we have been able to show that the tumor cells in Kaposi's sarcoma have CD206 on it, and so do the macrophages. And so that set up a clinical study using lymphoseq here at San Francisco General, a study done by Toby Maurer, who's the head of the Kaposi sarcoma program at San Francisco General and UCSF, along with the NVIDIA clinical group. In the study that was done at UCSF, there were five patients who had evidence of spread of the tumor. They not only had skin Kaposi sarcoma, for example, dotting up the leg with lesions that were large and small up the leg, but they also had some evidence of tumor potentially up in their abdomen somewhere. Prior to the study that we're going to talk about, um, there was no way of knowing whether Kaposi's sarcoma was actually in the abdomen um, or whether it was elsewhere in the patient's body because there's no imaging agents that allow you to say, this is Kaposi's sarcoma. And remember, we, we did these studies in tissue culture, and in tissue sections to show that the tumor all lit up with lymphoseq in the test tube. In one of the patients who received lymphoseq, in this case, they got injected in their lower leg, and within four hours, an image was taken. In every single place, there are about 27 places where there was Kaposi sarcoma on their leg, you see that the lymphoseq was taken up and gave a beautiful white radioactive signal on scan. There was also evidence of tumor in the lymph nodes in the body that hadn't been known prior to this imaging study. In one patient, the patient apparently had tumor in their brain. So lymphoseq, when injected subcutaneously, goes rapidly up the leg, goes into the bloodstream, and can penetrate into the brain, therefore can cross the blood-brain barrier, and if there's a lesion, like a metastasis or something in the brain, it can localize and light that up. The studies done at UCSF were quite illuminating and suggested that we could identify potentially all the sites in the body of tumor involvement. Now, the important point here is that when patients were injected with lymphoseq, the lymphoseq almost didn't go anywhere else in the body. Now, the nice thing about lymphoseq is that it's a backbone that allows you to attach different molecules to it. So you can actually track where lymphoseq is going, either with radioactivity, or you can put a fluorescent tag on it. In this case, we put one on that's called Psi3 that would make lymphoseq be red. And so what we did is we took a look at Kaposi sarcoma tissue, and we used the red-labeled Psi3, and we were able to show that the fluorochrome Psi3 would bind to not only the tumor cells, but also the tumor-associated macrophages. The next step is to take that same fluorochrome, the Psi3 labeled material, and then put some kind of poison onto it. So we could actually track the binding of lymphoseq onto tissue culture cells, 
and show that the poison would be tracking along with it. The poison we chose is something called uh, uh, doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is one of the most potent poisons used by chemotherapy uh, oncologists uh, today. Um, you can only give a certain amount of it in the lifetime of a patient because it poisons the bone marrow and it also poisons the heart. And so the unique uh, aspect of the therapeutic that we're going to be testing is if you could target only the tumor cells and the tumor macrophages with the doxorubicin, could you preclude the development of any of these toxicities to the heart and bone marrow? So that's the point of the novel approach that we're going to be taking. So we're able to show that the Psi-3 lymphocyte bound to the tumor cells and tumor macrophages and in organ cultures of cabbage sarcoma, where this is live tissue taken from a patient, we're able to show that the doxorubicin gets into both the tumor-associated macrophages and the tumor cells. The lymphocyte does not just bind to the cell surface, but once it binds, it's brought into the cell. So it's an exquisitely specific targeting approach for targeting tumor cells and tumor-associated macrophages. Now, how is it killing the tumor? Does it just go in there and blow them up? Or is there a specific process that's called programmed cell death? And this is going into a cell and flipping a switch, and the cell commits suicide. And that's that would be the best way to kill a tumor, rather than popping it and elaborating all sorts of factors, right? So we did a test in tissue culture of macrophages that had been put in a culture they express CD206, and they're tested with the fluorochrome Psi-3. And you can see that the CD206 positive macrophages all take up the Psi-3 lymphocyte. You do the same experiment now with the doxorubicin Psi-3, and you see that all the macrophages take up the doxorubicin Psi-3. When you look the next day, 85% of those cells have undergone programmed cell death. So we've been able to show now not only specific binding, in targeting with the fluorochrome Psi-3, but when you stick the poison onto it, it goes only into those cells and it induces programmed cell death. We looked in the cabbage sarcoma tissue. When you look the next day, 70% of the tumor-associated macrophages have committed suicide and are no longer in the tissue. The tumor cells of cabbage sarcoma are infected with a particular virus called human herpes virus number eight, or HHV8. So you can actually track what's happening to the tumor cells by looking for HHV8. Overnight, 60% of all the tumor cells have disappeared. And if you now apply this program cell death test, they have undergone program cell death. So if we reiterate now, what we're doing in cabbage sarcoma is we're using lymphocyte to light up the sites of tumor in the body, something that could never be done before very specifically. We're coupling it with a fluorochrome called Psi-3, so we can actually use it to test in culture whether the drug is taken up. We now put it into organ culture. Where we can show that it binds to and is taken up into the actual tissue of the tumor. And the next day, 60 to 70 percent of the tumor macrophages and the tumor cells are gone and they've undergone programmed cell death, which is a normal way that cells recycle in the body. So we're incredibly excited about this program, not only using uh, lymphocyte to identify sites of tumor, but just imagine you go into the doctor, you get the lymphocyte, the doctor says, you've got these sites of tumor. But we've got a drug that uses the same targeting molecule to then usher the cancer therapy directly to those sites of tumor and then a week later, you can get re-imaged with the lymphocyte and see if we've been successful at ridding the body of tumor. The approach that we're taking now will kill that source of growth factor. That's the, the strength of targeting this M2 or tumor-associated macrophage. Not only are we just interfering with one factor, we're killing off that cell population that's nurturing the tumor. This will be the very first approach ever to target the cell that we believe is driving the cancer cells to grow. So today, I hope I've given you the background of the idea of how we can target tumors 
both from an imaging perspective, quantitate where the tumor is, but also for the future, how we can then direct specific therapy only to those sites of tumor using the same sort of a backbone targeting agent. I do believe that this is an important adjunct, it's an uh, adjunctive approach for cancer therapy that to date has never been taken. So this will be a brand new approach that NVIDIA and UCSF are gonna coordinate going forward. Lymphoseq is a radioactive diagnostic agent indicated with or without scintigraphic imaging for lymphatic mapping using a handheld gamma counter to locate lymph nodes draining a primary tumor site in patients with solid tumors for which this procedure is a component of intraoperative management, and guiding sentinel lymph node biopsy using a handheld gamma counter in patients with clinically node-negative squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity, breast cancer, or melanoma. Important safety information. In clinical trials with lymphoseq, no serious hypersensitivity reactions were reported. However, lymphoseq may pose a risk of such reactions due to its chemical similarity to dextran. Serious hypersensitivity reactions have been associated with dextran and modified forms of dextran, such as iron dextran drugs. Prior to the administration of lymphoseq, patients should be asked about previous hypersensitivity reactions to drugs, in particular dextran and modified forms of dextran. Resuscitation equipment and trained personnel should be available at the time of lymphoseq administration, and patients observe for signs or symptoms of hypersensitivity following injection. Any radiation-emitting product may increase the risk for cancer. Adhere to dose recommendations and ensure safe handling to minimize the risk for excessive radiation exposure to patients or healthcare workers. In clinical trials, no patients experienced serious adverse reactions, and the most common adverse reactions were injection site irritation and or pain. Full lymphoseq prescribing information can be found at www.lymphoseq.com.